Howdy. All right, I know there's more Aggies in here than that. All right, um, once again, my name's uh, Todd Sink, and I'm going to be presenting on the status of uh, red drum uh, in the U.S. Uh, aquaculture. I want to acknowledge my co-authors, Dr. Robert Vega, Jennifer Butler, and David Abrego with the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department because uh, in terms of red drum culture, um, there used to be a lot of research by universities and private producers, and now a lot of that is driven by stock enhancement programs, so they contribute a lot to these types of uh, uh, presentations. So, um, in terms of red drum status, um, it's commercially ready. It's been commercially ready. It's been in production since the 1980s, so we have almost 40 years of sustained large-scale commercial production of this species. Um, it's been a major species in both the 2005 and 2013 U.S. At DA Census of Aquaculture. It's been large enough in production to be have its own separate species category. In 2013, when that census was taken, we had seven production facilities in two states that produced 1.5 million kilograms worth an estimated $10.2 million. Um, when I was preparing for this project, uh, calling around to various states and other uh, 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 territories putting together, right now um, for this, I identified 17 commercial facilities in six state hatcheries in three states and two territories. So it is a, a rather large commercial production uh, industry. When we look at current uh, global um, production of red drum, um, it all started in the U.S. in the er early to mid-1970s. Um, culture began in, in the U.S. shortly after that. Taiwan started producing red drum in 1987 and was followed shortly by China in 1988. Um, other red drum producing countries currently include the Bahamas, Belize, Singapore, United Arab Emirates, Ecuador, Israel, Martinique. I'm not going to try and pronounce this last one because when I looked up the enunciation of it, it's not pronounced anything like it's spelled. <laughs> Mexico, Mayo, and French Guadeloupe. So, in 2013, the top 10 foreign marine species globally totaled uh, 1.2 million metric tons of fish production in aquaculture. Of that, uh, red drum ranked eighth in production with 71,000 metric tons. Um, when we look at our, uh, the diagram I produced there on terms of uh, red drum producing states, you'll see the U.S. in um, uh, 2013 had 1.5 uh, thousand uh, metric tons. Um, it's estimated in 2016 that we had uh, just a little over a thousand metric tons of production. Um, I want to point out real quickly that those numbers in 2016 um, were kind of restrictive because one of our major hatcheries was out of commission at the time, so there was actually a, sh a shortage of uh, available fingerlings. And I'm also going to note that in this newest aquaculture census that's being completed right now, it's also probably going to be very low compared to what the actual production is because one of our uh, hatcheries was completely wiped out by uh, Hurricane Harvey and is still getting back on their feet right now. And uh, the reason why I bring this up, you'll see shortage comes into play here a little bit later in the presentation. So our current red pr drum production in the United States is basically consists of uh, three main states. Um, South Carolina has one commercial hatchery and one production facility. Last time I spoke with that owner, he is looking to retire. Um, he's in the audience today, and that facility is co currently for sale. So anybody looking to immediately jump into a turnkey red drum operation, you can seek him out. Um, Florida has one commercial production facility, and of course, the uh, Florida Fish and Game Commission, uh, or I'm sorry, Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission um, has a stock enhancement program, so they do have a state uh, hatchery. We also have minor production in U.S. territories. Both the U.S. Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico have one facility each that has intermittent production. But when we talk about red drum production in the U.S., we're really talking about the state of Texas. More than 95% of all commercially produced redfish come from the state of Texas. Um, we have five commercial hatcheries. We have five full-time dedicated production facilities that grow nothing but red drum. 
We also have six to eight partial production facilities. Those facilities grow a large proportion of red drum, but they also grow hybrid striped bass or catfish or some other species. Um, we, Texas Parks and Wildlife Department has three large state um, hatcheries and three large production facilities for stock enhancement. And just to kind of give an example of what Parks and Life, Wildlife is doing, they're producing between 15 and 35 million red drum per year, and they produced over 718 million since 1983. So quite large scale production. Now, when we look at the distribution map, so um, our um, full-time designated hatcheries are the pink stars. Um, our full-time production facilities are the uh, blue, or I'm sorry, the green. Our state hatcheries are the blue. And yes, that is not a mistake that is not out of place. If any of you have heard of the Permian Basin where they did all the inland marine shrimp production, we have large groundwater brackish water supplies in West Texas where they do uh, marine shrimp production. There's also now a full-time redfish hatchery and farm facility located inland. In terms of reproductive biology, we know it very well. Sexual maturity uh, is, occurs as early as three years, but most fish mature at four years of age. Um, the size the fish is at at maturation really doesn't make a difference. It's uh, purely an age-based maturation rate. The spawning season um, is, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the wild spawning season. And so the adults undergo seasonal migrations in the fall to um, passes. They're known as bull red runs. And the reason why this is important is most of our broodfish are wild caught. And so during these bull red runs, the broodfish are highly concentrated and they're very easy to collect. So it's a very opportune time to go out and get your brood stock. The Gulf of Mexico spawning peaks from September to October. Although it's very protracted spawning season, you can find larvae anywhere from August to as late as December. Um, along the Atlantic coast, the spawning peaks from August through September. Uh, moon phase is very critical in terms of reproduction, um, especially the three to five days surrounding the full moon is when we see an increase in, in spawning. <clears throat> um, in terms of uh, fecundity, they are a bat spawner. They ovulate up to eight times during the spawning season. Um, in the wild, they'll uh, produce a, a batch of eggs every seven to 12 days. Um, the average uh, female uh, produces between 160,000 to 3.2 million eggs per batch. So that's just a single batch. It's very much size dependent. The larger the broodfish, the more eggs she's going to produce. Mean batch fecundity is 1.5 million eggs among fish of all sizes. So they're very fecund species. Now, when we look at um, all those batches from a female spawn across the season, total annual fecundity can be as high as 60 million eggs per female. So you don't need to maintain a lot of brood stock to supply a very large commercial production facility. The eggs are positively correlated, or I'm sorry, the number of eggs produced are positively correlated with total length. And so far we have not seen any evidence of an old age at which cessation of spawning occurs. The females remain fecund throughout their entire life cycle. When we talk about obtaining brood fish um, in, if for a new hatchery, well, there's very few uh, brood fish that have been reared to maturity. Um, it, right now, it looks like only around five to 10% of our brood fish used in production are captively bred. Most of them come from the wild. It is possible to produce and mature your own fish in captivity, and it's starting to become more uh, prominent now that we're starting to look at some selective breeding, but historically it's been primarily a wild brood fish harvest. So um, most brood fish um, are captured from the wild, like I said, and most of them originated from Matagorda Bay, Texas. Um, the reason why is that is in close proximity to just about all of the commercial breeding facilities. We have had some concerns about uh, genetic diversity in these fish in terms of selection, but when Texas Parks and Wildlife has done their coastal ass assessments, basically the entire coast and into Louisiana, Texas coast and into Louisiana is one genetic mixed stock. They mix quite regularly. Um, each state has different brood stock collection permit permits that you have to acquire. It's fairly easy in Texas. I understand South Carolina could be a bit of a pain, um, but uh, 
you can get rootstock collections from the state. We typically use hook and line capture because it's the least stressful method. And like I said, during those bull red runs, they're very easy to catch. You can obtain a large number of broodfish very quickly. Um, one of the reasons why we're still using a lot of captive fish is because once we capture them, they uh, remain in production for very long periods. Most of our captive broodfish have been in production for over 10 years now at most of these commercial facilities. We have one facility that has a batch of broodfish that's been in production for over 17 years now. So red drum are also a very long-lived long species. Um, in terms of the spawning, most of the year broodfish are just held in uh, outdoor ponds with natural uh, photo period and temperature conditions. Um, so we just allow them to mature naturally in the ponds. Um, when we're ready for spawning, we sex the brood stock and we bring them in to recirculation, aqua, or recirculation aquaculture um, spawning systems. Uh, the preferred size is 9 to uh, 16 kilograms. Um, the typical stocking density is we'll stock three males to two females. Um, some other stocking combinations have been tried over the years and they do work, but every, one, every hatchery, commercial hatchery, tends to go back to this three to two. Um, most of the tanks that we're using are um, around 20,000 uh, liters. Um, some of the state hatcheries use much larger tanks and so they stock at much higher densities. They'll have as many as um, uh, 30 males and 20 females per tank in some of these very large systems. Um, the birdfish are fed a mixture of mackerel, shrimp, squid, and beef liver. Um, the beef liver really helps provide some of the supplemental um, uh, lipids and uh, uh, vitamins. They're fed typically three to five percent of body weight, three to five times per week. And their uh, uh, spawning success and egg quality have been closely linked to the type and quantity of feed fed. So if you want to keep these females producing five, six, seven, eight batches of spawns, you got to stay on high nutrition. Spawning, um, when red drum industry first kind of got started, a lot of it was done with manual spawning, um, but that practice has been largely discontinued in the U.S. There's some problems with it. It requires, you know, correct assessment of egg maturity at the time that the females are taken and injected with the spawning aids. Um, the other thing is it typically only yields one batch of eggs. And so it doesn't really optimize your um, female production. What we typically use now is tank spawning. Um, uh, when we bring these into these recirculation aquaculture um, tanks, we want the salinity to be greater than 28 grams per liter. That has nothing to do with the broodfish. It's all based on what the salinity needs to be and the water density to keep the eggs floating for the, the egg collectors. So uh, we use photothermal uh, conditioning to induce maturation. We basically simulate the conditions of the annual photothermal cycle and we compress them into two main photothermal regimes. One is a 120-day cycle and the other is a 150-day cycle. Cycle is ideally started under natural winter conditions. 150-day um, cycle um, will produce four to eight spawns from a group of brood fish over a 30-day period every five, uh, five months of production. I'm not going to talk too much about this because I already got him standing up behind me and I know I've got a lot to get through. But these are just some examples of what a normal photothermal cycling regimes look like. This is a 120 and 150 day regime. Um, in terms of egg management, fertilization and water hardening are allowed to occur within the tanks. The floating eggs are allowed to accumulate in a skimmer device overnight as most uh, spawning occurs during the evening hours. Um, incubation, the eggs are stocked in low volume flow through incubation tanks. Um, and the density of the eggs you stock all depends on your water exchange rates. Uh, some of the hatcheries that have good access to bay water and can flow a large volume of water, they'll do 100% water exchange per hour and they can stock up to uh, 3,750 eggs per mil. Those that are more recirculating systems, um, they'll do 100% water exchange over 24 hours, so they're going to have a much lower stocking density of 185 to 300 eggs per liter. Um, you need very copious aeration to keep the eggs moving, but it needs to be light enough not to damage the eggs by beating them up too much. 
In terms of larvae management, from those eggs that you get, you can typically expect 90 to 95 percent hatch rate from the fertilized eggs. Um, hatch is largely dependent on temperature. So at 21 to 30 degrees, they're going to hatch in about 24 to 30 hours. At 27 to 28 degrees, they're going to hatch in about 18 hours. You definitely uh, need to reduce aeration after um, hatching that because the larvae are negatively buoyant. They sink to the bottom where they uh, remain for a short period before they further development and then they begin swimming up. Um, Larvae can uh, swim, or three-day larvae can uh, swim horizontally at 21 to 23 degrees Celsius. So once again, temperature affects the uh, development rate. At 21 to 23 degrees Celsius, mouth parts and eyes are formed and pigmented at three days, whereas at 27 to 28, mouth parts develop within 40 hours. Fingerling production, larvae are moved to fertilized ponds when ready to feed. Um, it ranges from 40 hours at 30 degrees Celsius to 85 at 20 degrees. Uh, acclimation to the pond is very critical. Optimal salinity is about 30 grams per liter. Pond production um, depends on suitable density of live food and proper production at all times. If you stock 300,000 larvae per acre, you can expect a harvest of about 60%. Um, I'm going to stop right here because I know I'm over. and so. Um, if anybody has questions, I was going to get into nutrition and grow out after this, but I'll be more than happy to answer them during the forum afterwards. You have a summary slide. Not a clean summary slide. Thank you.